Welcome, my name is Rachel. I'm so glad that you're here with us today at the SCC online campus. We have an incredible message for you today. Let's join in. We are in our series. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. I don't feel like doing the QVC stuff this morning, so you'll just have to bear with me. We're gonna jump right into the Word because I, I find there are sometimes there are messages that feel pertinent uh, and applicable more so than others. I feel like sometimes there are messages and there are weekends that feel like they are, uh, the, 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 the hammer is striking the anvil with such precedence uh, and that we have to lean in and figure out what, what is going on in the moment. You have to understand that we are living in a pressurized world. We are absolutely living in a pressurized time, uh, culture, season, age, and day. We are living uh, in a pressurized uh, uh, culture that, uh, can, let, let me just talk about it. I, I brought it up at the beginning of the year that this would be a year that regardless of the highs and lows of your life, that we should pattern ourselves and model ourselves after the 24 elders sitting around the throne in heaven who are doing nothing regardless of the highs and lows, the good and the bad. They are doing nothing but locking onto the presence and the person of the one sitting on the throne. We, we are living in a pressurized political atmosphere right now. We're living in a time where, where the political motors of agenda are just beginning to start on both sides of the line. And I need to let you know that the answer for America does not reside and lie in Washington, D.C., it does not reside with congressmen, senators, uh, uh, presidents, vice presidents, and politicians. The answer for America is a king sitting on a throne, and his name is Jesus, and he is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. We're living in a pressurized moment in the world where we're seeing wars and rumors of wars play out in front of our eyes not only in the Middle East with Israel and all of its enemies surrounding it, but that that war is coming to our doorstep and onto our college campuses where there's such an attitude of anti-Semitism that we haven't seen in years. And the fact is we live in a pressurized culture right now that's telling us that this is appropriate. I need to let you know, we will be a biblically based church that will pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but we will also pray for every person in that area that is experiencing uh, the effects of war, be they Palestinian, be they Arab, be they uh, Jew, be they Christian. We're living in a pressurized time and we have to lock in on what matters most. We're living in a pressurized time where the American version of church has gone rogue and renegade. Where even recently, entire denominations have voted in to adjust their verbiage so that uh, what the Bible calls sin would be found appropriate in its posture of living as a Christian life and as a Christian person. It's a church, hear me, by and large, that is, uh, that is lethargic in its slumber on one hand, or it is apostate and run away in its open and blatant sinfulness. We are living in a pressurized culture day and age. And this is why, hear me and hear me clearly, I feel a burden that we have to lock in on being students of the word. This is why I think it is imperative that we have to lock in and absolutely understand what the Bible says, not just to be knowledgeable of it, but to be doers of the word. That we find ourselves as disciples, disciplined ones that are spirit-filled, anticipating that these signs will follow them that believe in his name because it's signs and wonders that prove the authenticity of the gospel message that Jesus is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, that he left heaven to live as a human, to die for us, to be resurrected from the grave and now currently sitting at the right hand of the Father. It's signs and wonders that prove the authenticity of that message. You can clap. We are living in a pressurized world and I believe that if we lean in for whatever reason, 
I don't believe in circumstance. I don't believe in happenstance. I don't believe in just that things just happen for a reason in the life of the spirit-filled believer. But I believe that today the Holy Spirit is knocking on the door of all of our hearts because we are all living in a pressurized moment. And if we lean into this message today, we will see that we, like Jairus, have an opportunity to trust Jesus, regardless of what the situation looks like, regardless of what the situation sounds like, that we can lean into him and find that he still does all things well. To trust me. This is the answer that Jesus gives Jairus when he says, have faith, just believe in me. Jesus is saying, trust me. Trust me is an expression to reassure or convince someone that what the speaker is saying is true. And it's often used to emphasize the speaker's credibility and assurance that they can handle a situation. In the political arena, I just wanna let you know, Jesus is credible enough that he can handle the situation in America. In the situation of Israel, Jesus is credible enough that he can handle the situation there in Israel and on our college campuses. Jesus is credible enough, watch, to handle the situation that he will call out from among them to be them separate, a remnant church, a remnant bride of Christ that will go out into the highways and byways and be a city set upon a hill, light in the darkness of the world around it and bring healing to those who are hurting. Amen? He's credible enough. We can trust him. And so this is where we find our scripture and our passage today as we lean into this. This is, uh, this is the continuation of, of what Pastor Bob pre preached on last week when the woman with the issue of blood, it starts with a man and then turns into a situation with a woman. But we read in Mark 5, we're going to read 21 through 23, and then we're going to jump into 35 just for context so we can refresh our memory. Verse 21 says, and Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side and a great crowd had gathered around him on the shore. Then the leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so that she can live. And then we go through the next several passages of scripture where Jesus is on his way. J Jairus is in a, in a tense moment. Jairus is in a pressurized moment. Jairus is, he's reaching out and saying, Jesus, uh, if you show up, it's only you that can do something in my life and in my family's life. And then as sometimes it feels like it happens, it feels like God gets sidetracked when he's supposed to be answering our situation in our prayer. This woman with an issue of 12, 12 years and with an issue of blood shows up and it's an incredible moment in her life. And it's an incredible moment for the people that are experiencing this. Uh, but do you ever feel like, like you are, you've, you're the one that called on God and you're praying and he starts showing up in other people's lives and you're just waiting around like, hey God, I just, just want to remind you that, that you have yet to answer my prayer. Like I'm the one, like it's cool, heal them, great. But don't forget me in this moment. I can't be the only one that has had to crucify my flesh. When I'm like, it's great, they got what they needed, but I'm still here, God. Come on, I can't be the only one that's looking around and seeing that he's answering other people's needs and he's meeting them at their point of need, but hey, God, I just, I just wanna remind you, I'm still like Jesus, like context, let's be a fly on the wall in this moment. They're walking down the road, they are pressed in around everyone, uh, around Jesus, uh, to the point that when the woman touches him and he says, who touched me? The disciples look at him and say, how can you even ask that question? There are so many people here. Jairus is one of those guys that is trying to think in the moment, why are are we stopping? I've got a need in my life. I've got a problem. And God, you're taking a pause in route to my house. This is where we pick up. Verse 35 says, while he was still speaking, this is after Jesus has just healed this woman and they're navigating this woman's faith. 
While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. In other words, trust me. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Verse 38 says, when they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion and people weeping and wailing loudly, loudly, and when he entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside, took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in to where now the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years old and they were immediately overcome with amazement. Verse 43, we're landing the plane on this passage of scripture. It says, and he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. I, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna like lean into this moment in verse 35 that, that everyone is excited about the miracle in the moment and the miracle in their midst that they had just witnessed. There, everyone is just, it, it just, just blown away at what they had encountered and the fact that they were eyewitnesses to this woman who had been plagued for 12 years. But here is Jairus uh, who is fretting in the moment and you can understand where he would be nervously clutching at his hands and just, and just fidgeting and fiddling with everything around him because he's trying not to impose rudeness into the, the path of Jesus, but he is absolutely trying to get Jesus us to hurry up in the moment because we still have to get to his house. And then all of a sudden, while Jesus and everyone are high-fiving and they're doing chest bumps and good games and attaboys, somebody makes their way into Jairus, to Jairus and says, hey, don't even bother anymore. It's of, it's of no use. It's of no avail. She's dead. She's gone. It's pointless. Jairus is in a tense moment right now. You could say he's in a pressurized moment. Watch. And it's moments like this, watch, where Jairus has come to the end of his ability and come to the end of what he can logistically uh, fathom and conjure up to fix his situation. He comes to the end of himself because he has exhausted all that he knows how to do. And this is the perfect temperature for a miracle to show up. This is exactly often what God needs in our life because I'll be, I'll be the, the transparent one. I'm a little bit of a control freak. And sometimes what I need is God pausing enough to allow me to come to the end of myself so that I can then truly invite him in and I take my hands off the steering wheel altogether. Sometimes what I need is, is I, need, I need to take a, where, where the church at times and the world is counting out what God can do. We need faith to simply step into this moment and realize and encourage us that our situation might be big, but our God is absolutely bigger. That our situation might be strong, but our God is absolutely stronger. That our situation might feel like it's 10 feet tall, but we serve a God that takes down 10 foot giants with little things like stones. Come on, somebody. You need to be encouraged that you can absolutely have faith. Step into your situation. Even when other people are telling you it is so pointless. We can have a moment. Hear me, hear me. Where we let faith start to push into the situation. Even though others are saying it's to no avail. Here, here's what I love. Verse 36. Hear me. This is, this, is, this is fun. Jesus, hearing the conversation. Remember, Jesus is having the high five and the ESPN top 10 moment right here where people are just blown away and they're in awe. And hearing the conversation to the side of him that's happening with Jairus. He turns and watch. He doesn't address the issue he addresses Jairus. 
I find that, I find that puzzling to me. He doesn't, he doesn't deal with, th- there's been moments where go, your faith has made you well. Where he, there's been moments where the, the son or the servant were healed in the moment that Jesus said it. But in this moment here, Jesus begins to address Jairus, not the situation. Often the storm, I'm wanting him to quiet as in the wind and the waves uh, that he does, that he reminds me instead of addressing the storm, he begins to address the the, the storm that is exterior. He begins to address the storm that is on the interior. He doesn't begin to address what's going on externally outside around me. He begins to address the storm that is going on internally inside me. There are times when my emotions are driving me and they are at the same fever pitch as the storm that I am experiencing and the fervor of the situation I'm in. And here's what I need. I need him to realize and to, to bring, to bring into my awareness that he needs to calm me before he needs to calm my storm. Because if he doesn't, then I will continually live the rest of my life. Hear me being emotionally driven and not spirit led. I will allow my emotions to run and rule every situation I come into. So if Jesus doesn't come first and calm and subside the storm in me, then the next time the storm comes up, I've learned nothing. I need him to calm me. Here, we, we have the, God, why didn't you show up? Why, uh, where, where were you when I needed you? Why haven't you done all that I need? They are questions, hear me, that speak that I am momentarily unstable in my faith. So what I need is a peace be still for the storm out there that runs parallel to a peace be still and know that I am God internally. I need both. But more often than not, because I'm a control freak, I need him to address me before I have him address my situation. Because I can be so sideways emotionally and not connected into him spiritually that I miss what he's attempting to do overall in my life. This is where Jesus looks at him and just says, trust me. Trust that I am credible and that I can handle this situation appropriately. Hear me. Uh, verse 39 and 40 is, 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 is really cool. I want you to think about it. Can we, if we can timeline this, he went inside, yes, and asked why all the commotion and weeping. The child's not dead, but she's only asleep. 40 says that the crowd laughed at him, okay? But hear me. He's yet to see the child. He has yet to lay eyes on the child. He's just shown up at the house. He's in the foyer of Jairus's house. He's in the narthex of Jairus's house. He's in the lobby of Jairus's house. He's just kicked off his Jerusalem cruisers and he's hanging up his cloak there on the coat rack in Jairus's house and sees all this commotion and says, she's not dead, she's asleep. Why am I painting this picture this way? Because I need you to understand that your faith will always look strange to them that are faithless. Come on, your hope that God will show up will always look strange to those that are hopeless. Your obedience will always look strange to them that are disobedient. Your righteousness will always look strange to them that are unrighteous. Come on, I'm thankful that I serve a God that even when he hasn't even shown up in my life, one, he's already said, trust me. And two, he's already given a diagnosis to the situation before I even feel he's laid eyes upon it. I'm thankful that we serve a God that understands he has a plan and his ways are higher than my ways and his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Here's what I love. Jesus shows up, watch, remembering what he already told Jairus out on the road. Trust me. 
And because I said that, I don't even have to look at the girl. I don't have to look at the situation. I can let you know it's not what it appears to be. It's not as it seems. What am I trying to convey to you? Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. In your situation, does God speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? This is why it is imperative, watch, in a pressurized culture and in a pressurized season of life and age where we have to know what God has said about situations in our life. Because if we can find what he's already said about our situation, we can then stand on faith knowing that what he said will come to pass, that the world around us can laugh us to shame and laugh us to scorn, but we will stand on the B-I-B-L-E Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Why does this matter? Because when I add my faith to the promise I find where he's already promised that I could trust him because he's good to his word. 2 Timothy 3 says, uh, 2.13 says, if we are faithless, he is still faithful for he cannot deny himself. Whatever he promised you about your situation, he can't deny himself. Whatever he's assured you about your situation, he can't deny himself. That ought to make even a Presbyterian happy in this moment. And if you come from a Presbyterian background, that's not a knock on you. That's just an expression, all right? But hear me. Genesis 28, 15. He says, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. I got to find what he said about my situation and care less about the people that are laughing me, laughing at me because they don't understand the faith that I'm trying to stand on. Come on. Romans three, four says, let God be true and every man a liar. Come on, you got, this is why we have to be uh, uh, focused in on the word and students of the word. This is why we, whenever you can encounter a situation and a storm and a trial, what has he already said about it? And let it stand while everything around you is sinking. It gets even better. Hear me, verse 40, go back to verse 40. It says, they're all laughing at him. And he makes them, he makes, uh, uh, he made them all leave. He made everybody, but mom, dad, the folks that came with him and him, he gets them all out. Why? Because sometimes we need the addition of subtraction in our lives. What? I want you to think about that. I want you to take an internal inventory and an audit of the people that have access to speak into your life. Are they people that are uplifting? Are they people that are faith filled? Are they people that are hope filled? Are they people that speak blessing over you and stand on the promises of God for you? If not, we need to take an internal inventory and an audit of the people that we have given access to speak into our lives. Think about this. Jairus went to go get a miracle And simultaneously, by the time they show up, the funeral has begun. That means Jairus is standing in faith and someone's planning a funeral. Jairus is going to get a miracle and someone else is planning a funeral. Jairus is trying to stand and believe and there's someone around him that is not walking the same manner that he's walking. This is why you need to audit the people that are in your life. This is why you you need, you need to know who is surrounding you. Jairus, who are the people in your life that you've given access to? to speak into your life. This is why your community matters. This is why the corporate gathering of worship matters. This is why life groups matter. 
This is why Bible studies matter. This is why guys night matters because we need one another. Iron sharpens iron. We need people in our life that when I'm weak, I can lean on you knowing that you have my best intentions in mind, knowing that you're not gonna be like, well, I guess that's karma. What a trivial thing to say that you won't find in the Bible. Well, I guess that's just the stars in the sky and how how things are supposed to line out for you. Here's what I need to know. I need somebody that will come alongside me and say, no weapon formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that rises in judgment, you shall condemn. I need people in my life that say, Nathan, you are more than a conqueror. I need people in my life that say, Jesus is no respecter of persons. And if he showed up in their life, he will surely show up in your life. Somebody say amen. I'm not even caffeinated, y'all. I'm just excited. I'm just excited about you recognizing you can stand on the word. And when God shows up and says, trust me, it doesn't matter what the situation looks like. It doesn't matter how dire the situation is. It doesn't matter how broken the situation is when he says, trust me, you hold on to it because when God speaks, it doesn't matter what your situation looks like. You need the blessed addition of subtraction in your life. I'm not saying snub your nose at them. I'm not saying be self-righteous and pious and arrogance in your in your religious routines, I'm saying you need to audit the voices that are filling you up. And if you don't have healthy voices in your life, come talk to me and I'll find some healthy voices for you. Here's, here's what happened. Verse 41 says, holding her hand, he says to her, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, get up. Watch, Jesus is operating in the same MO that he always had. He looks at nothing, calls something out of nothing, and that something doesn't stop operating because he never told it to stop. In the beginning, the world was formless and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God brooded over the waters. Genesis 1, 3. And God said, let there be light. And light came out of nowhere. It had never existed before. But because he spoke it, it came into being. It obeyed the, the structure of his voice. It obeyed the orders that he gave. Here's, here's what happens with us. Similarly, we have to lean in. And even though my situation feels futile, futile, and even though my situation feels bleak, even though my situation feels like it's already over. And even though he didn't answer my prayer the way I was hoping he was going to answer. Job 13, 15 says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Yet will I praise him. Though he didn't respond the way I was wanting to, he responded in, sovereign, in sovereignty the way I needed him to and I just didn't know it. And that is, a, that is so perplexing to my faith. That doesn't make sense when my world is crashing in around me and that doesn't make sense when my world is caving in around me. 
I don't know what it's like to stand like three Hebrew boys at the, the edge of a furnace and have a king tell me to bow my knee or I'll burn. And then to stand up and say, oh king, our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we won't bow. Even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't show up, even if I don't understand why he answered the way that he did, I'll still trust him. I still trust him. And I know it hurts. And I know it's agonizing. And I know there's times where I'm angry. And I know there's times where I'm frustrated. And I know there's times where I lash out at the people I love. And I know there's times that I can't give audible expression to the storm that is raging on the inside of me because I'm in a pressured moment. But I have to, to realize that I can just reconcile all of my feelings in the moment that I have to trust Him. I got to trust Him because His ways are higher than my ways. I gotta trust him when I don't like the response. Here's what happened with Jairus in this specific situation. The Bible says that she got up and began to walk about. It's the Greek word peripateo. It's the derivative of the same word that Jesus would use with his disciples in Luke's gospel in chapter 10, when he would send them out two by two and they came back rejoicing saying, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Verse 18 says, so he told them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven and behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over the power of the, all the enemy. Hear me. When she got up, she didn't get up walking in the same manner that she had prior to this moment. She got up and was converted. And because, hear me, because of the, the, the faith of a father who trusted in God, one generation's trust and faith gives another generation a testimony. One generation's faith and trust in God gives another generation a testimony. Hear me. SCC, Salem Community Church. 50% of the people that show up to church here on Sunday morning that show up for the first time, 50% of them are not church transplants that have some background at another church. 50% of them have no real relationship with the Lord. They are spiritually asleep. And so what we need, Salem Community Church, men and women, we need a fathering generation. We need a mentoring generation. We need a discipling generation that will trust in God for a generation of new believers younger than us that they will encounter the presence of Jesus and begin walking in a manner that they had never walked before. This is why we do all that we do at Salem Community Church. This is why we are so intentional with everything that we do. This is why we adjust seating in the room so that we can fit a new generation and a younger generation of uh, that will be Christians to encounter the presence of Jesus. This is why we put efforts into all that we do. This is why we spend money on the next generation in Salem kids and Salem youth. This is why we have care pastors and care leaders. This is why we do something different. Jairus broke protocol with what he did going to Jesus. It was outside of the scope of normalcy for that day and age. This is why we adjust and make pivots in everything that we do so that we can encounter a generation that has yet to encounter Jesus. That's not age that's spiritual items. Spiritual. Does that make sense? 
We need to disciple people. We need to mentor people. So we'll do whatever it takes so that we can trust in God for them, that he will give them a new manner to walk in. Let me give you an example of trusting. We've been praying for Ben McCaslin for quite some time now. He's been on the, the, the prayer chain and the prayer list. Ben doesn't even go to the church. Ben goes to Rise Chapel. Ben was diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor. He went in for surgery. The surgeon lays him down, puts him under, opens him up. And the tumor is so deeply buried that the surgeon looks and says, I can't get into this. I can't, I can't, I can't get this. I can't remove this tumor. So they literally close Ben up and send him home. That tumor began to grow to the point that it was causing numbness in some areas of Ben's life and pain in others. And so two weeks ago, they went back to the doctor and they laid him down and put him under again. Same surgeon opens him up. He's literally looking at Ben's brain. He says this, I don't, I don't know what to do. There, nothing has changed. I don't have access. All of a sudden, there's this, what would seem like the smallest of spotlights of light coming from overhead and highlights one specific area on Ben's brain. The surgeon immediately understood, I think I can get in from, from this position to get to the tumor. So they got surgery underway, removed the entire tumor from his brain and he is now recovering hear me, with no issues, no, no fallout from, from the tumor growing in his brain. Uh, uh, the, when the doctor spoke with Ben's wife when surgery was completed, he told her about this ray of light pointing to the right place to enter. Ben's wife said, well, you know what that was? That was God. Sometimes I realize it's, it's not the situation that we're hoping for and it's a pressurized moment where we're anticipating God to show up and we're, we're trying to navigate what's going on and sometimes, hear me, he doesn't even answer the way we're anticipating. It can't move me off trusting in him. It can't move me off of the fact that he's, when he doesn't heal in this situation, I still trust him and I call him a healer. I still call him a healer. When it doesn't make sense to me, I still call him a healer because that's who he is. Proverbs three, five through six says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Trust in him, have a firm belief in the reliability or the truth of someone or something. I imagine there's a lot of people in here that are having a, have one situation or another that feels pressurized where you realize you need to trust him. That hope, that dream, your future, that diagnosis, your spouse, your children, your finances, your job, it's pressurized. And I wanna invite you to a moment where you just trust him. And still Job 13, though he slay me, though I'm dying in this moment, and I don't know how this is going to work out for me. I will still trust him. So glad you decided to join us today. At Salem, we are intent on creating community centered on Christ. The best way to connect in our community is using the digital connect card where you can ask questions or get info on anything going on at Salem. If for whatever reason you can't be here with us in person next week, we will see you right here on our online campus.